Hello, hello. Welcome back to the channel. I am super excited today to bring on my friend Ian Love. I met Ian through the Springboard to Wealth program through uh, Thatch Nguyen's Inner Circle, basically both in the in the coaching program. And we've grown to be great friends. And Ian is super, super accomplished in real estate investing. He has been investing for over 10 years and has found a lot of success in the strategy that we talk a lot about on this channel, which is house hacking. And so I really wanted to bring Ian on to share his experience in house hacking. He's even done a lot of syndication deals up to 25 million and 250 plus units in two states. And so Ian, I'm super excited to have you here to start getting into this and chat about house hacking. Thank you for having me. Super excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, um, give us a little background on yourself. When did you start investing and how did you decide that, you know, you want to start real estate investing? Yeah. So uh, my background is as a CPA. Uh, so I, I came out of school in 2009, um, needed to get a job in something. It was the Great Recession and uh, accounting, you know, tax was something that I knew I'd be able to come out, make a decent living in uh, and kind of give me a good foundation uh, for my investment career. Um, and kind of growing up, uh, our family, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, we didn't invest in real estate, uh, but I did have a lot of friends, you know, on both sides of the spectrum. Uh, some of them had uh, parents or grandparents that had invested over the years. And, uh, and then some of my friends were like myself, didn't, you know, didn't have families that had been investing for generations. But I was really able to see, um, you know, how important that was and how important uh, owning real estate uh, is and kind of keeping that in the family is to uh, creating that generational wealth and setting your, your family up for the future. So I knew I wanted to get into that as soon as possible. That's sweet. So you kind of went through high school and college knowing that you wanted to eventually start buying properties. Right, for sure. Sweet. What was your goal initially when you first got your job and you were getting ready to buy a house? What did you want to buy initially? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, it was, I was kind of coming out in the, the Great Recession. So there was a lot of foreclosures, uh, a lot of bank-owned properties. Um, you know, since I started uh, in accounting, as you can imagine, as soon as you start in accounting, your goal is to retire from accounting. <laughs> so it was, a, it, was a good, it was a good way to start my career. But um, my goal has always been, you know, get out of uh, the rat race, per se, and get into full-time real estate as soon as possible. Um, but also do that in a way that could increase my net worth, uh, help me uh, with peace of mind, and uh, really just set myself up and my family up for that uh, generational wealth. So uh, with that in mind, I uh, started looking at different opportunities, different ways that I could get my foot in the door. And uh, I started with a duplex, a bank-owned foreclosure duplex uh, that I was able to buy. Uh, and I bought that for 260000 and I saved up for my first uh, two years of work and was able to save up 26,000 for that. Uh, so about you know, 10, 15,000 a year I was able to save. So not a, not a huge amount, right? But I was only making 50, 60,000 a year. Um, but that was my, my first foray into it. And then I, I lived in the top unit and uh, rented out the bottom initially to family and friends and kind of learned the ropes. Uh, on how to, you know, structure leases, how to, how to be a property manager, um, mm -hmm. kind of what rules and regulations to, to have in your leases. Uh, and yeah, really just kind of cut my teeth uh, through that strategy. That's great. That's a really good idea to run out to people, you know, first, especially on your first one so that you can get a feel for being a landlord, right. And get those rules. And it's hard to make mistakes when you know the people you're, who's renting from you, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's actually probably easier to make mistakes <laughs> when you know the people that are renting for you. Right, but, right. Um, but I didn't know anything about marketing or, you know, going, I don't think we had a lot of the sites we do now, like Zillow Rental Manager and um, mm -hmm. some of the marketing websites. Uh, even Craigslist, I think, was probably in the real early days, right? So um, the fastest way I knew how to get, a, get somebody in there that was going to pay me a, a decent amount was just uh, friends, family, and just kind of uh, learned that way through, uh, through that process. That's awesome. And how old were you when you bought your first duplex? Uh, I was 24. 24. Okay. And how long from getting your first job as a CPA did it take you to buy a house? Uh, about two years. Two so years. I, yeah, I graduated in 22, yeah, around 22 and took me about two years. 
Okay. What else were you doing in that time to get yourself set up to buy? Yeah. So I had roommates. Um, I rented a three bedroom apartment with two other people uh, to save as much as possible and keep my rent as low as possible just so that I could, um, so I could get out of that uh, situation from renting to buying as soon as I could. Um, so as soon as I got, you know, 20, 25,000, I started really looking hard at, uh, at small multifamily properties or something that had a mother-in-law or something that I could rent out and live on one side and rent the other. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So first one was a duplex, you bought it as a foreclosure, right? Did you have to do a lot of work to it? Uh, a lot of the work, thankfully, was more so like landscaping and, uh, it was really a diamond in the rough, I would say. So the interior wasn't uh, wasn't too bad. Uh, I had to refinish some hardwoods. Um, I added a stackable washer dryer downstairs because it only had one. So it just kind of made it more of a separate unit a feel. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of it was landscaping. So mm -hmm. another way, you know, of learning that landscaping is really one of the the biggest bang for your bucks when you're trying to to add value to a property. Um, and, uh, you know, it's much cheaper than doing, you know, electrical plumbing and, and things of that nature. So thankfully it wasn't Sweet. too bad. <laughs> nice. What was your mortgage payment on your first duplex and how much rent were you getting? Uh, so my mortgage, I think it was about 1400. So I, I bought the property for 260, uh, put 26 down. So I had about a $230,000 loan. Uh, my mortgage was 1400 back then and I was able to rent the bottom for uh, between 800 and 1200 depending on who I had living down there um, mm -hmm. in the beginning it was closer to 800 and then after about a year I was able to get 1200 so you were paying $600 max to right. live in your own yep awesome and it only took two years right to get right. yourself set up to buy right that's really cool. So you went from renting a room to keep your expenses low, which I think is really key, right? When you want to save to buy property, you have to keep your living expenses really low so you can save a lot of your income, you know, if you're in a salaried job. And then you go buy something where you get your own unit, you rent out the other one, and you're living almost free, right? And eventually free. How long after you bought that duplex did you buy your next one? Uh, it was about two years. So the crazy thing is, right. So I rented, or it took me two years to save $24,000, right. 12,000 a year. So, uh, but then when I, when I started renting the, the duplex, the bottom of that, that's an additional 12,000 of income that I was able to save per year. So right. I went from being able to save, you know, 12,000 a year to 25,000 a year. Plus I was getting, you know, small raises at my, my job. Uh, in public accounting. So um, I was able to, a few years later, actually do, you know, take that uh, 50,000 or so that I had saved after two more years. Plus uh, I did a cash out refinance um, that valued the property uh, at closer to 400,000. In two years? Right. There you go. So I was able to take, um, I was able to take those additional funds from the cash out refinance, it, it made my loan go up a little bit on the first property, but since I was only paying a few hundred dollars a month, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Uh, and then I took the, the cash out proceeds uh, plus the 50,000 I had saved from, uh, from my job and from the unit downstairs. And I rolled that into a, a fourplex house hack. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was able to get an owner occupied rate on the, the fourplex, um, and then rent out the other three units there. And I bought that for uh, 560,000. And I was able to put 20% 20, uh, 20 down on that, 25%, let's say. So uh, 140,000 down on that. Sweet, yeah. And you could put less down, right? With an owner occupied right. loan, but right. it just made more sense for you on the monthly expenses to put more down. Yep. Cool, did you have to do work yeah. on that fourplex? Yeah, so that one, uh, the mortgage on that was about thirty two hundred when I first got it, um, and the rents for the all four units were about eight hundred. So mm -hmm. when I first, you know, when I first got the place, it was about it would have been eight hundred or so to live there. Um, but then if you take the, uh, you know, I was renting the other the old place right for a thousand on the bottom, and then the upstairs, mm -hmm. you can rent for fifteen hundred. 
-hmm. So uh, the mortgage went up a little bit to to 1600. Okay. So I was able to I was able to take the 900 there, right, and apply okay. that towards the the next one. And then you're essentially living for free again with two properties that are appreciating uh, with mm -hmm. living for free. And then you've got, uh, you know, the principal pay down, uh, the, the property appreciating tax write offs. And then you're able to take those those savings. And then I was able to kind of scale over the years by doing, uh, you know, similar strategy. There you go. And how many more times did you house hack into new properties? How many uh, multifamilies do you have total? Uh, so I have eight properties now in Seattle uh, with 27 units. It's awesome. Yeah. Just by doing this repeating every single year, right? You're rolling yeah. your rental income and your equity into the next one to keep, you're basically stacking. Right. That's super cool. And this is a pretty low risk strategy, right? For sure. So, you know, especially with the first one, you don't have to worry about if it's going to be somewhere you're going to live. You know, the alternative is you're going to live there by yourself uh, or you're going to or you're going to rent. So when you're looking at it versus that scenario, you know, if you can get a thousand bucks a month, two thousand bucks a month coming in to offset some of those expenses, it's really hard uh, to lose, you know, going that going that route. Right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not even something I've thought about because I'm in the process of buying my first house tax and be a tri or fourplex. And I hadn't even thought about when you buy the second property, you can roll that extra income into offsetting your mortgage payment even more so that you even more you have even more cash flow on the following properties you buy. For sure. That's sweet. So Ian, you have done, well, first, any big lessons that you've learned or any huge mistakes you've made along the way that you know you would probably impart some advice on to someone who's just starting out on this strategy yeah I, I think you know trying to find the perfect deal is it's not not necessarily a mistake i've made often right i've i've kind of just dove right in and um i'm willing to kind of learn on the go most of the time um mm -hmm. but i think one mistake a lot of newer investors will make is trying to find that perfect deal uh over you know, analysis paralysis, right? So going through, you know, underwriting a hundred deals, trying to find the perfect uh, duplex or the perfect, uh, you know, single family with a mother-in-law. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, find something in an area that you're already living uh, that has either a mother-in-law or an additional unit potential. Uh, work hard to save the down payment, right? So in my case, it took me a few years. Um, not mm -hmm. everybody's going to be getting um, investor money or uh, family money, right? So sometimes it does take a little bit longer, but once you've got that first one under your belt, uh, like you were saying, you can you can stack those, uh, roll that into another one, and repeat that process a couple times, and you've got, you know, you can get to multi million in a real estate portfolio very quickly, uh, mm -hmm. just by using the leverage that uh, real estate affords you. So yeah, just get get in the game as soon as possible, really. So you're saying real estate's not going to be easy? These gurus lied. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's definitely not easy, right? So um, it's simple. It's simple. It That's is simple. Like real estate, it's it's hard, but it's also simple. And there's a lot of proven paths that we've seen, For like sure. Ian. Um, good. So Ian, you have done some really cool bird deals recently, especially since joining Springboard to Wealth, and you've done some really big syndications. Can you tell us a little bit about both and compare them to something like house hacking? Yeah. Yeah. So in 2016, I had done about four, uh, four deals on the personal side from two to four units. And I really wanted to, um, you know, I was reading a lot of bigger pockets, uh, learning a lot about syndications and kind of understanding more on apartment, uh, apartment deals and things like that. And I, I wanted to scale faster because I was, you know, I realized that it's going to take me a year or two to buy another property, save up, buy another property. Um, so in 2016, I did my first syndication, uh, which was I actually invested in another syndication as a limited partner in 2016, uh, which was a 15 unit over in Spokane, Washington. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, all the legal side of things, how to handle investors, how to raise capital, uh, how to manage investor expectations. And then I, I took what I had learned there as a limited partner. And in 2018, I did my own syndication, which was a, a 70 unit here in Washington state. 
Um, that was a $2 million deal. We raised about uh, 700,000 for that. Wow. And then uh, in 2020, uh, we uh, continued, you know, wanted to scale, uh, uh, grow the portfolio that way and had other, you know, investors and friends and folks that wanted to invest. Um, so we bought a 175 unit uh, rehab deal in Tucson, Arizona, about a mm -hmm. mile from the U of A. And, um, and that one, you know, it ended up being just before COVID hit. Uh, it was a it was a hundred percent student housing facility, so um, and we raised five million for that one. The deal wow. was uh, eight and a half million dollars to buy, and then there was a renovation budget as well for for three million. So uh, I've kind of gone the whole you know syndication route, um, and I'm actually unwinding those now. We sold the the Tucson one last year uh, for nineteen million. Mm -hmm. So you know after many sleepless nights and after you know battling uh the covid uh scare and uh kind of working our way through that with student housing in tucson not being our university of arizona not being in in school for several months um we were kind of able to able to navigate that but uh you know as i've kind of parallel right i'm doing the the burr model and uh the house hack uh building single family small uh what are called detached additional dwelling units in, in seattle Mm -hmm. um, which are essentially kind of standalone townhomes that the city of Seattle is allowing you to build. Um, but, you know, going through both of those, I've really learned that, you know, after managing a $25 million portfolio and kind of understanding, uh, you know, how much you can take home from that as a general partner versus the amount of stress and headaches you have from managing, you know, five, six million of investor money and investor expectations. Um, I've really found that you can, make you know just as much money if not more uh kind of going through the burr model uh doing small development opportunities in, in great neighborhoods of seattle and uh really just being uh uh you know having that clarity on on what you're looking for the types of deals you're looking for and uh, i've kind of found it's not necessarily go big or go home but keep it small and keep it all mm-hmm Love that. That's awesome. So syndication, where you're raising money, you're managing money, you are uh, paying out to investors, right? Versus the Burr model, where you just buy a property that needs work, where you can add additional units, especially in the city of Seattle, where the zoning allows for, you know, a lot of units in one dense spot. Right. And we can find these gems, right, inside Seattle and uh, remodel and add units to increase our value and our equity. And then we refinance, get our money back and keep repeating that process in the Burr model. Can you tell us a little bit about the Ian Love deal that we've coined inside the inner circle with uh, Thatch Women's Coaching? We call this deal the Ian Love deal because Ian is working on this deal and it's a crazy, crazy equity play. Can you tell right. us about it? Yeah. So like you said, the, the city of Seattle right now, and many cities around the country are allowing what's called uh, detached additional dwelling units, uh, which essentially is trying to create more housing. There's a shortage of housing across the country. So different cities are looking at different ways that they can help with that, you know, whether it's allowing fourplexes on a single family home or a single family neighborhood or uh, two to three units. Um, but for Seattle in particular, they're allowing you to build uh, a detached dwelling unit up to a thousand square feet uh, on any lot in Seattle that is zoned single family 5,000, uh, mm -hmm. which means as long as the lot is 5,000 square feet or bigger, uh, as long as there's room, uh, you can put a, a DADU or a detached dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. So um, what I've really been looking for and what uh, is really uh, a hot thing for investors in the area right now is to look for homes that are, that are on one side of the lot or the other, uh, that are uh, that have room on the backyard, or the side yard to build one of these detached dwelling units, um, uh, preferably on an alley that has alley access, so that the the back house can be developed and have separate entrance uh, from mm -hmm. the front house. And then what the city of Seattle is actually allowing you to do is what's called uh, condominiumizing or condoize, uh, which allows you to actually separate the two parcels, so you can separate the front house and the back house, and actually sell those off as separate uh separate homes so uh 
with that in mind, uh, what I've been looking for is those types of opportunities. So one that I'm working on now was a, mm -hmm. a two bedroom, one bath home uh, in, a, in a good neighborhood of Seattle that has an unfinished basement uh, with a big backyard on an alley. So what, what I'm doing is I'm converting the front house uh, from a two bedroom, one bath to a four bedroom, two bath uh, by finishing out that basement. So what it, uh, I bought the house for 700,000. It's mm -hmm. gonna cost me 150,000 to renovate the front house and add those two bedrooms and a bathroom. Uh, so all in 850,000. And the, after that's done, the home will be worth anywhere between uh, one to 1.1 million. Uh, when I when I went into it, it's closer to 1.1, but I'm uh, being a little bit conservative with the, where the market's going. So conservatively, uh, there will be about 150 thousand of equity that I'll be able to add in the next couple of months on that front house. Ooh. Not uh, to mention. Yeah. So not to mention, right? The the real money on these types of deals is on the back development. So you essentially are getting that back lot for free, if you think about it. So uh, you work with an architect, you get a structural engineer, uh, and you drop the plans for the, this townhome. And in Seattle right now, uh, it's anywhere from $300 a square foot to $350 a square foot, uh, depending on, on where we're at in the market and who you have doing the work for you. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, these are limited to 1,000 square feet. Uh, by the city of Seattle. So anywhere from 300 to 350,000 to build one of these units. Mm -hmm. uh, and depending on where you're at in Seattle, these, these homes have been selling for anywhere from 600,000. I've actually seen a uh, detached dwelling unit sell for 1.1 million uh, a few months ago. Um, wow. You know, that was largely a product of 3% rates and the, yeah. the, man, you know, the mania that we were having months yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, but the, the one that I'm looking at building now, it's going to cost me about 300000 to build mm -hmm. um, and will be anywhere in the 800000 to 850 range. Wow. Um, so that's an additional right 500000 of equity to 600000 of equity on, on one deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's, you know, add that to the front house and you're, you're close to three quarters of a million on, on one deal. Whew. So when you boil it down on this house, you paid 700 for this house. It's on a huge lot or, you know, a 5,000 square foot lot. Right. It's going to cost you 150 to fix up the house. The house alone is going to be worth a million dollars when it's done. So you've got 150 yep. of equity there. You got the back lot for free. You're going to pay 300 to build this thing. Your, your dad, your detached, uh, ex detached accessory dwelling unit. Yep. It's going to be worth 800 when it's done. So that's another 500, 600,000 in equity. Right. Boom. That's the Burr model right there, right? Right. And so at the end of the day, you could refinance and get all your money back, right? That you put into. Right. Yep. Yeah. So you have options, right? So you, when you, when you go to refinance, you can condoize both of these and you mm -hmm. can decide what, you know, what amount of mortgage you want to put on each property. So uh, if you want to make sure you're cash flowing, right? So the front house is going to rent for closer to 4,500 with the back wow. house renting for, closer to 3,000, 3,500. So you wanna make sure when you go to refinance, you're putting a debt amount that uh, is supported by the cash flow that you're getting from each property. Mm -hmm. um, you know, assuming you're not gonna live in one of the units. Uh, mm -hmm. I kind of call it the, this is almost like a grown up house hack, right? For people that mm -hmm. don't wanna share a wall, they've done a few house hacks and mm -hmm. they wanna live in maybe the new construction dadu or they wanna live in a, a brand new, re newly remodeled home for, for essentially free, um, you know, you have options there. So, so awesome, Ian. So, from a duplex all the way through to a half a million plus equity deal just by house hacking, almost, right? For sure. That's awesome. And you're going to maybe house hack this one too, this poor right. deal. Yeah, I'm, we're considering if we want to live in one or the other now. Mm -hmm. um, kind of going to see, so, how, see how it plays out. That would benefit you by renting out the unit that you're currently in. Right. Yeah. So the unit that we're in now, I'm still house hacking. Um, uh, I'm house hacking a triplex. Um, and I, I, you know, I rent out the top and the bottom units. Uh, if we were to move out of this one, we'd rent this one for 2,500 to 3,000 and then move into the, 
you know, one of the others. So if we move into the daddy, it's almost like a break even play. Uh, if we move into the front house, then we're, you know, leaving, you know, let's say 1500 a month on the table, but we're having, you know, living in a brand new four bed, two bath right. in a nice neighborhood. You so. deserve it, Ian. <laughs> you worked hard for it, right? And you finally yeah. get to live in something well, nice. We'll get there eventually, right? <laughs> How much, if you don't mind sharing, total cash flow are you making on your multifamilies that you've house hacked in the last 10 years or 12 years? Yeah, so I'm right around uh, 13,000 right now. Uh, and my goal, once I uh, build the dadu and um, and get that fixed up. And then I have another daddy that I'm building. Uh, my goal in the next, you know, six months or so, once I've built these out is uh, a little over 20,000 a month passive. And you're going to get there in the next six months, just yes. from two or three extra deals. Yes. Just from finishing what I got in the pipeline for sure. Wow. Compare that to syndication, the, the syndication deals you were doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, to put it in perspective, the, the 750,000 that I'll make on one deal with uh, no investors, right, is close to what I'll make uh, on, a, on a deal that we sold for 20 million, uh, where we raised $5 million, doubled everybody's money in two years. Um, and then once that's split amongst the GPs, uh, you know, you're not making as much as, as people really think. Um, you, when people say they own, you know, 500 units, 1,000 units, you don't own 500 units or a thousand units as a syndication. You might own a few percent of that, right? So the, mm -hmm. the Jeep general partners generally take 20 to 30% of a, the total equity pie with mm -hmm. the investors taking 70 to 80%. So when you look at that 20 or 30%, you're generally splitting that with, you know, five, four, five, six, sometimes 10 people. So rather than owning 30% of a, you know, let's say 100 units, which would be 30 units, you might own five, you know, 5% total. So you really only own five units, but you've got the investor headache, the, the risk of, you know, a $20 million investment. Uh, you know, you're, there's just uh, the peace of mind com compared to you just having that clarity, going out and finding uh, a deal that uh, has a very high equity margin on it for you that you don't have to go get investors on. Um, mm -hmm. to me, having done both sides is really, uh, the way to go. And it has helped me sleep at night and helped me achieve my goals much faster without having to worry about investors or, um, or anything like that. There you go. What do you think specifically clicked for you that you want to get out of syndication? Well, you're still in syndication, but you're focusing like heavily on burn house hack, right? What do you think helped you make that switch? I think just having seen both sides and, uh, you know, being in Thatch's mastermind, uh, seeing he's, you know, he's had experiences with hundreds of units of development, he's still doing, you know, hundred plus unit syndications. Um, and just kind of seeing, kind of seeing the light and seeing, um, you know, that you don't need to, to raise $5 million of investor money and go out and buy a big apartment building mm -hmm. to, to make good money in the real estate market. You really just have to have high standards, uh, know mm -hmm. what you're looking for, uh, really uh, put that out into the universe almost that this is what I want, this is what I'm looking for. And, uh, you know, just having that clarity. Um, so... I, you know, there, there might be something where you, you want to build a big team. You want to go buy a thousand doors. Um, that's great. Um, mm -hmm. but for me to achieve my personal goals, uh, which my short-term goals, 25,000 a month passive, which I'd like to get to next year, um, with, with that much money, you know, I'm, I'll be able to quit easily. I'll be able to do, you know, what I want, when I want with who I mm -hmm. want, uh, you know, and I'll still be, you know, mid thirties with, uh, you know, able to go do that full-time real estate thing. So um, there you go. That's awesome. Going like, yeah, it's really cool to do hundreds of units of syndication deals, but that freedom option of choice can be found in a few really great deals, right? That's sure. what we learn a lot in Springboard. Right. 
Awesome. Ian, you sound so nonchalant about making thirteen to twenty thousand dollars a month. People aren't gonna believe you. <laughs> what is the one thing that you would say is key to being successful in real estate investing? Um I think, you know, it is there are times where it's stressful. I would say more so if you're gonna go out and get a bunch of investors and and try to take down an apartment building. Um I think, uh, you know, the main thing is, uh, I would say, just jump in, try to find a deal that's a house hack, don't overthink it, and don't, you know, try to find the perfect deal. Um, for me, it was not a perfect deal. It was completely overgrown. You know, it was, uh, you know, there was definitely times, months where I didn't get paid at all, but the the default was that I just paid a mortgage that I that 90% of people that own homes are, are already paying for by themselves anyways. So like the, you know, the downside of owning real estate um, or owning a, a house hack deal, a two to four unit uh, is really just, you end up being like the other, you know, 90% of homeowners that are out there. So I don't know if that answered your question, but just <laughs> no, kidding. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Well, Ian, I really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story and sharing about house hacking. My viewers, I think they're going to take a lot out of this. Um, we're largely the younger crowd who are just getting started into real estate investing. What would you say is the first step to start doing this? Um, I think, you know, for me back when I was starting, right, Bigger Pockets is great. Uh, meetups are excellent. There's a lot of free meetups. I think meetups.com, if you just type it in and type in real estate in your neighborhood or your, your city, you'll go find 20, 30 of new friends that are all investing in real estate that'll all tell you, you know, things like uh, the city's zoning, which is really important to go find those high margin deals. Um, just surround yourself with other people that want to get out of the rat race, want to learn about real estate, and uh you know just want a better life for them and their families and uh really just be conscious of who you're surrounding you know spending your time with uh really dive in learn as much as you can about real estate but as soon as you have enough money saved up right you only need three four three and a half percent really on your first owner occupied home so mm -hmm. that could be 15 20 000, which it might seem like a lot but even if it takes you two to three years just buckle up save that money uh, and get ready to, you know, change your life through your first fam multifamily house hack or your first, you know, single family house hack with a uh, room rental or a mother-in-law, but um, it's worth it. So it. just get in. I love it. Fuck up. love. It's going to make you rich and wealthy. <laughs> there you go. Follow Vena. <laughs> Sweet. Well, thanks again, Ian. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I'm going to have Ian's information below. If you want to join the coaching program that we're in, I'll have those links below. Um, some of the other programs and softwares that we use to find these deals. Um, if you have any questions for Ian or myself, leave them in the comments below. We'll check them out and we'll see you in the next video. All right. Thank you guys.